Hello, everyone. This is Jennifer Tillman with Keller Williams Preferred Properties, as well as a board member with Prince George's County. Um, I'm talking to you guys too. Um, and so what I've started is a monthly seminar series where seniors, caregivers, baby boomers, uh, people who are caring for loved ones would be able to come out and get resourceful information that will help them. And so we have a monthly seminar series that's always on the second Tuesday of the month, second Thursday of the month, starting at 2 p.m. And so again, I'm Jennifer Tillman, and this month we have Jennifer Brandy, an attorney who will be speaking on Medicaid myths. And so as you guys are seeing online, we are also presenting in person. So, and I have my admin, uh, Debbie, who will be looking at the chat. And so if you have questions, put them in the chat. And whenever we have a break, we will um, open for questions and so on. So again, Jennifer Tillman, um, at the end, you have my phone number and how to reach me. But if you get on our mailing list, you will be able to attend all of the future uh, seminars that we have. So at this time, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, uh, Jennifer Brandy. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you for everyone who is joining us online and also in person. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, Medicaid planning is one of the things I do at my firm. I also do estate planning, trusts, special need trusts. I manage guardianship matters. And um, oftentimes when folks have uh, problems using financial powers of attorney, I can sometimes untangle them. So my practice is generally elder law, but it's anyone who, any adult um, could be affected by some of these issues. So I'm just gonna jump right into the Medicaid myths. I feel like there's a lot out there. There is a lot of misinformation or misunderstood information about Medicaid and what it can and cannot do. And this is the Medicaid long-term care benefit, which is very specific and very different from Medicaid health insurance, which has different rules. So I won't be touching on that, but, but this is strictly Medicaid long-term care. So can I, okay. Myth number one. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> All right. Medicare will pay for long-term care. So Medicare and Medicaid are very different. Um, sometimes the words are used interchangeably. It's a common uh, mistake, but the benefits that it provides are very different. So Medicare is really the insurance that one receives at a certain age in life, uh, usually when Social Security kicks in or if you've had if you've been on SSDI, which is Social Security Disability Insurance for two years, it can kick in. And Medicare will pay for the first 100 days of long-term care. And that calculation will vary depending on if uh, you've had a stay already in, um, in skilled care or long-term care, and maybe you were only there for some of the time, and maybe you ended up back in the hospital. We won't get into the more um, complicated aspects of calculating that, but for all intents and purposes, Medicare is 100 days. So where, where it, it's a little bit confusing because even though it says it'll pay 100 days, it's not a true 100 days. It'll pay the first 20 days in full. And then it kind of goes on a staggered basis. So that's where that supplemental healthcare insurance comes in. So I highly recommend that for the older population because that supplemental insurance will pick up the co-pays that Medicare does not pay for long-term care in that 100 days. So then what happens sometimes is um, a person will find themselves in long-term care. They think they have this 100 days and all of a sudden the business office at the nursing home is saying, your Medicare is running out or um, we, your Medicare is not going to cover this anymore because the, the skilled care you're getting provided is not helping you progress. So number one, that's not the actual standard, but that's what happens. And it's very hard to fight against it. Like an appeal can be lodged, but oftentimes they're not successful. So what happens is then the individual has to go towards Medicaid to look as a payment source. So that's why um, it's good to talk about Medicare that it can cover the first 100 days, but sometimes a person gets knocked off of it. Um, and that's where a lot of stress happens for families. Um, and it would be good to talk to uh, an elder law attorney to 
discuss what the options are at that point. So we can go to number two. All right, I have too much money to qualify for Medicaid long-term care. So I'll just say briefly that here, here are the rules in terms of having assets for Medicaid. For an individual applicant, so that's someone who's not married, maybe divorced or widowed, never been married, that person cannot have more than $2,500 in their individual name. That is a very low amount. Um, most people do have more than that. So any amount above that would have to be spent down. And that's where we come in, us attorneys who do this kind of work, because we're just not going to simply spend it on the nursing home. We have other asset protection strategies that we use. So you can have more than the asset limit. Now, let me just touch on briefly on married couples, because the rules for married couples are different. So as of 2024, a married couple can have approximately $150,000 in assets, and anything above that has to be spent down. So that's, I mean, 150,000 sounds like a lot, but it's not when you know, you're know you later in life and these are your retirement savings. So again, that's where we come in to use the Medicaid rules to preserve assets. So you can have assets above these amounts and still qualify for Medicaid. Where we come in is, is how we take this these assets and um, for example, for lack of a better term, put them in, they may be in bucket A and we put them in bucket B. Okay, so without getting into all the different asset protection strategies, because some of them are very fact specific. And when we get to the answer, question answer segment, maybe some people will have some specific questions and I can kind of get into what those strategies look like. So, okay, myth number three, Medicaid will take my house or I must sell my house to pay for my care. So I have this little cartoon on the slide and it's People are probably thinking, why is that there? It's actually a children's book <laughs> by Jack Kent, and it was written many, many years ago. But it's it's a really great book because I sometimes it's it's really like a metaphor for life. Um, as you go through the story, there's this dragon that just one day appears in the house, and it's like, what's this dragon doing here? The parents don't see it. The little kid sees it, and it's like, what's going on here? Um, over the course of the story, the dragon's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's being ignored to the point where eventually the house is just carried away by the dragon. Dad comes home. It's like, what happened to my house? <laughs> um, the little boy eventually convinces his parents, no, there's really a dragon right here. And mom pets the dragon and it reduces to the size of a kitten. And mom says, I, I can deal with this size dragon. So think of the dragon is like a problem that's being ignored. Um, I find oftentimes when people call me, um, there's an older adult a loved one, whether it's mom, dad, aunt, uncle, maybe a sibling, where they're really sort of ignoring um, some planning that should go into this stage in their life, really at any stage, but particularly at this stage. And the problem just gets bigger. Um, sometimes I find that when people call me, they get frozen about the house. That's why this picture is here in relation to, will Medicaid take my home? They get really nervous and so they do nothing. You know, someone looks like they may need long-term care, but they're just, they, they, they just don't want to address it. They don't want to talk to anybody. They're ignoring the problem. It becomes a bigger problem. Um, sometimes people come to me when it's too late. They've already sold the home or they've transferred it in a way they shouldn't have. Some things could be undone. Um, but what I want to tell people in regards to this myth is that it is a myth. Medicaid will not take your home. Okay, they're not just going to say, okay, you're applying for Medicaid long-term care. You need to sell that and give us the money. They can't do that, okay? Um, you don't have to sell your house to pay for long-term care, although there may be instances where it is a good idea. So, and usually that happens with the single applicant um, and maybe there's not much family and it doesn't make sense to hold on to this house because who's going to pay the property taxes and the bills and things like that. And so there are instances where I recommend it be sold. And you know, then you use the money and you can pay for your care and have some, some choices. But by and large, um, the families that come to me, they're so worried about losing this home. So what I will say is that during um, someone, someone receiving the Medicaid long-term care benefit, they could Medicaid could put a, a lien against the home during life. But I have to say that about 90% of the time they don't do it. I am not the only attorney will that, tell, that will tell you that. It rarely happens. So I don't know if they're just not organized enough or if they're just not not really sure what happens in their offices. Um, you know, if it's just a detail that they just kind of leave alone. 
they do have the right to put a lien, but they oftentimes do not. Where it does come into being a problem is usually on death and the house is still in that applicant's name who received the benefit. Medicaid 80% of the time does file a claim. Okay, so that is where they, and they can only file a claim for the amount of money they spent on that person's behalf and not a penny more. So it is calculated down to the penny. So, I mean, that is another place where it can happen, but like in the instances of married couples, what I do, and it's totally permissible and it's consistent with Medicaid rules, is that I will, we will get, we will go in the process of getting the applicant qualified. We will transfer the home to the spouse that's still in the community. That's permitted. And that's just a good way to sort of take it out from under having a claim in, in probate, um, having something linger and, um, for any potential liens during lifetime. So I think it's just it's just something that we do. And I think that, and then there's sometimes other things we can do. There, There's a, uh, and I'll just get into one um, spend down strategy for, for this topic. A lot of times a adult child or an adult care, I mean, let's stick to the adult child actually. Adult child will move in with parent um, or vice versa. Parent moves in with adult child. now. In those instances, um, if they've been there for at least two years taking care of this, this um, parent, then the home can be transferred to that child. And that's that's pursuant to Medicaid rules. So that's another sort of good option that we can use to help protect the home. Okay, we go to myth number four. Let's see, which one? Myth number four, a trust will protect my money. So yes and no. Uh, some people might have heard of revocable trusts. So like the name suggests, it could be revoked, it could be undone. And that's where an individual or a married couple can put their assets into this trust. So a lot of times when I do revocable trusts, it usually involves the home because that's a probate asset. And we want to kind of make it easy for heirs and beneficiaries to just, you know, the trustee can sell that home and distribute the assets and it's it's outside of the purview of the court and the probate process. So it's just a nice vehicle to, to, to take care of the home on death, but it's not going to give you any Medicaid protection. It's also not going to give any protection against creditors for the for the for the individuals who establish the trust. So it's um it's not a tool for Medicaid planning at all, because sometimes people call me with that question. However, there is an irrevocable trust, a Medicaid compliant one that we could use. I don't really use them very often. It does have some downsides. One of them is that for it to be Medicaid compliant, you have to, you as the individual who's funding that trust with your assets, you have to give up control. Okay, you're naming another trustee. So that's one of the reasons it becomes Medicaid compliant, because it becomes what's called an unavailable asset. For Medicaid purposes, but that's something that you really want to consider. Do you want to like deed your your home to this irrevocable trust and and give up all, you know, rights to it? Um, do you want to put your money assets into this trust and have someone else manage it? I mean, you need like extreme trust for whoever you choose, and I'm just not sure if it's worth it because there's so many other strategies that we use uh, that we often and kind of referred to as crisis strategies, meaning something has happened and long-term care needs to be applied for right now. So there's there's so much that's available to us attorneys that we I'd rather use those rules and have that person retain control over their assets. So I'm not, they do have a purpose. I'm not saying that they're never used or they never should be used, but it's the kind of thing I just sort of weigh with, with clients based on like what they tell me. And uh, one more thing that um, I neglected to just say about myth number three in terms of uh, whether Medicaid can take your home, as long as it's indicated on the application that you intend to return home, Medicaid considers it an unavailable asset. So that that's one of the reasons why like you're not forced to sell it. And even if you intend to return home, like there's no possible way, no objective way that that would happen. It's a subjective intent, meaning like, the person would like to return home. So that's all you need to do is just check that box. Applicant intends to return home. The home is considered exempt. It doesn't need to be sold or spent down. Okay, we can go to myth number five. Okay, I must spend all of my money on the nursing home before I qualify for Medicaid. So th this, this is something that's... Um, 
you know, frustrating for me is that I often hear from people that call me that the nursing home has told the family that all the assets have to be spent in order to qualify for Medicaid long-term care. So, I mean, it's not necessarily untrue. Oh, you can go back to number five. Thank you, Debbie. It, you could spend, you could liquidate everything and spend all the money on nursing home care, but you don't have to. You're not, you're not required to. You, the money does have to be spent down in some form, okay, to get to those asset limits of twenty five hundred for the individual, one hundred fifty thousand dollars for the married couple. But there's so much that we can do, especially with uh, a married couple. So one example is a lot of times the married couple is told, okay, husband, you live in the home, wife is here in care. You've got to liquidate her IRA, and we need to like use all of it. But that's not that's not necessarily true, okay? The IRA could be liquid; it will have to be liquidated. That part is true, okay? But it could be put into a Medicaid compliant annuity, and become an income stream to the husband. So that's one of the strategies that we use. So that's why I said before we kind of take assets in bucket A, put them in bucket B. One example of that is taking an asset and turning it into an income stream because the rules for income are very different. So, okay, we can go to myth number six. I can put all my money in my spouse's name and qualify for Medicaid. So that's not true. Um, for better or worse, when there's a married couple, it is considered one pot of money and all the assets are counted. Now, it's, there, there are some rules. So because some, sometimes there isn't a strained spouse. We don't know maybe where the spouse is or maybe they won't cooperate. There are some rules that, that say if that's the case, then we shouldn't count all these assets as spousal. It's very hard to win that argument with caseworkers. Um, it, it is doable, but it's very difficult. And sometimes it's just flat out denied. So that, that can be a very sort of sticky situation. But for all intents and purposes, it's one pot of money. And what's interesting about it is that at the application, when, when the person initially applies, all the assets are looked at. But once the person achieves eligibility, the spouse will never be looked at again. So it's only that one time. So if someone is on that Medicaid long-term care benefit for five years, each year after they're initially eligible, there's a redetermination. The previous year's um, bank statements are looked at. But at that point, like when I've had the case, um, the, the the spouse who's in care, there's only one bank account, it receives their income and it goes right back out. So there's like no assets, nothing is linked together anymore as a married couple. So that's why, you know, it, it it's, uh, it's good to know that rule that it's only that one time that they look at, at them as a married couple. And in fact, after eligibility is put in place, the spouse who lives at home can win the lotto and the spouse in long-term care will still get their Medicaid. So it's kind of very interesting, mm -hmm. um, but but those are the rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is myth number seven? Okay, I cannot qualify for benef benefits for five years after I transferred assets. So that's another frequent concern that I hear is that, you know, someone will call and say, well, all this, you know, this money was transferred and that money was transferred. They're never going to qualify. And, you know, I, I just go through a, a lot of questions. Okay, so what was it transferred for? What was the money spent on? Who did it go to? Because it really all depends. Most people live their lives using their money, not really thinking about Medicaid rules, you know, like whether I'm going to need long-term care. It could be something that comes up in someone's mind, but from day to day, they're not budget budgeting their checkbook based on Medicaid rules. Things happen in life. Um, a lot of things happen. A frequent thing is that someone who is experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's, they may be sort of, you know, sort of functioning, but also being taken advantage of by scams. And they've transferred $100,000 in the last year. I mean, things like that happen. I could still get Medicaid eligibility. Usually what we do is we, we, um, we address it in the application. Um, upfront, everything's very transparent. We talk about what happened and it can still get approved. So it depends. It, I mean, those transfers weren't made for the purpose of qualifying for Medicaid. And that's sort of the relevant framework that the caseworkers look at. Like, why was it transferred? So as long as we can explain it, 
and have some backup documentation than, than normally, it's not an issue, but it is a frequent concern for people. Also, what I see sometimes, unfortunately, is that um, adult children take money from mom and dad. I see that a little too much. And so that's, that's another thing that we just have to address in the application, that that's what happened. Or sometimes adult um, children are being financially supported by their parents. And so there's like large chunks of money going to the kids, the kids. Um, but you know, these are things that can be explained. Sometimes the caseworkers may ask for the money to be put back, but it really, I don't see that very often. It really kind of depends. When there's just strictly like, because I did have a client a few years ago who right before he came to me, he transferred $20,000 to himself, you know? Um, and I just said, okay, let's just put that back. <laughs> and he did, he didn't do it maliciously. He just, he was nervous. He didn't know what to do. He knew that Medicaid was on the horizon, but I said, you know what, you have the money, just put it back. And guess what? That house in Arizona, we can transfer to you that belonged to mom because she's been living in your home for the last six years and you were her caretaker. Mm -hmm. And that application got approved. And that was a, a, a slight variation on the Medicaid rule. But I feel like as long as I explain everything very thoroughly um, and have some documentation to support it, my cases go through and get approved. Okay, so myth number eight. Medicaid planning can only be done before going into a nursing home. So that's not really true, but it is. Sometimes people think that what has to happen, oh, I need one of these irrevocable trusts, or you know, I should probably start gifting my money. But but no, I mean, Medicaid planning oftentimes happens, at least in my practice, when, when the person is in care, because usually it's some unexpected event. Someone's got, you know, it, it's something that just happened. So that's when I often get a phone call as the person's already in care. And it's like, what are we going to do? We're being told that Medicare days are ending. There's all this money. Like, what about the house? And, and that's where I come in and just help with that spend down. Okay, so myth number nine. Uh, this is a favorite myth of mine. <laughs> the nursing home told me that they do not have any Medicaid beds. So I must private pay. <laughs> I hear this one a lot. And I have to tell you that if it's a facility that accepts Medicaid, all the beds are Medicaid beds. So I think internally what they do as a business, they sort of like kind of calculate how many beds should be private pay and how many should be Medicaid. But that has nothing to do with Medicaid rules. If you are accepting the Medicaid benefit as a facility, each one of those beds is a Medicaid bed. So I've had to sometimes push back on the nursing homes about that. Not, not too often, but because usually once what's interesting and whether this is fair or not remains to be seen. But when people hire me and I send the letter and I say I'm helping them do the Medicaid planning, they all of a sudden back off. Mm -hmm. Everything that has been said previously to the family, everything stops. Mm -hmm. And all the stress stops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all the myths stop. <laughs> so, um, but this is one of them where, you know, they'll say, well, we don't have a Medicaid bed right now, so you have to keep private paying. But that, that's just simply not true. All the beds are considered a Medicaid bed. Okay, myth number 10. Okay, I don't know. This is a question for everybody. Do I need a lawyer for Medicaid planning? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think most times, yes. If there's assets, yes. I And I, and I realize that, you know, that helps my business. But at the same time, um, there's so much money I can help families save. And I'm not simply just saying that. It's just, you know, if... If I can sort of square away some of the myths, okay, no, no, don't sell the house. Don't do anything right now, okay? Just just leave the house alone. Or, um, okay, we can transfer the home in this way. Or, no, we can take these assets and still preserve them. Oh, you were a caregiver? Okay, great. I can transfer $100,000 to you as a caregiver. I mean, there's, there's quite a bit that we can do. Um, there's also certain kinds of uh, special needs trust that we could put money in and still have it available to enhance quality of life, but it's Medicaid compliant. So there's so many ways that um, we can help preserve assets that you're not gonna be able to Google. I've had people who are uh, very savvy with research. I mean, they have all these interesting jobs in DC and they'll come to me and be like, I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I can't find it on the internet. And, and, and you're not gonna find sort of these asset protection strategies that we do on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll get conflicting information of, and, and you're not gonna know whether it applies or not because 
The thing is, Medicaid is a federal program, but the states elect to opt in. Okay. So when the states elect to opt in, it becomes, it's, it's like a joint venture. All right. There's federal rules, but then the state can create some of their own rules um, that provide some additional things that the federal rules do not, as long as they're compliant together. And there's this whole process where that gets approved and we don't need to worry about that. But the thing is, what can be done in one state can't be done maybe in Maryland. Mm -hmm. So that's where the confusion comes in. Um, one thing I did not touch on is income. So, cause I mean, I'm sort of focusing on the myths, but in terms of eligibility, we talked about the assets and how you qualify based on assets, like where, like what amount you need to be at. But for income, um, you could pretty much have income up to like $10,000 a month and still qualify for Medicaid as long as it's right underneath the Medicaid payout rate. And right now it's about 10,000 a month. Med Medicaid pays about 10,000 a month. Private pay is between 12 and 15,000 a month for nursing home care. So it's quite, it's quite high. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have like pretty much right under that 10,000 threshold, you can still qualify. Um, in some states, so where this where the income becomes relevant is if you're trying to get the home and community based options waiver. So that's where you get long term care services in your home. It's under that umbrella of the Medicaid long term care. Um, that that would kind of going into all the rules of that and sort of the difficulties would be another hour presentation. Mm -hmm. But um, for that, there there is an income cap. So the income cap is roughly around 2,500 right now. Mm -hmm. In some states, if you're over that income, it could be put into an income qualified trust, but we don't have that in Maryland. Mm -hmm. So that's where the rules become confusing. Mm -hmm. You might do some research and think, oh, I, I think this is gonna work, but you know, the state rules are really gonna be important. So, okay, so I, I know I'm doing Medicaid myths, but I, Anytime I talk to people, I like to emphasize the importance of having a financial power of attorney because when that document is missing, when I'm doing this kind of work, it is incredibly stressful for the family. And I will do everything within my power to work around the fact that it's missing. But sometimes at the end of the day, we have to apply for guardianship of that individual because that's the only way a family member or a loved one is going to get the authority to act in terms of getting bank statements or accessing finances. Um, it's just an underrated document. A lot of folks sometimes think they can pull one off the internet, but again, it's one of those state specific issues. It has to be compliant with the Maryland statutory language. So if you try to bring it to a particularly a large national bank and it does not have that statutory language, it will be rejected. I guarantee it. I have people come to me and you don't wanna find that out when it's actually really needed. So I, it's, it's an underestimated document. It's so important. I have additional language in mind that uh, deals specifically with Medicaid planning um, because there are some additional authorities beyond the statutory language that is needed. Um, to uh, get some of those strategies in place. So it's just, it's one of those things um, relating back to the dragon in the house. There are some um, folks sometimes who are hesitant to come to an attorney. I understand we sometimes have a bad reputation <laughs> um, or there's nervousness about fees and things like that. But the thing is, if you don't attend to it, it becomes a much bigger problem down the road to where it, it just, it causes so much heartache. And it's true even in married couples because a lot of married couples think, well, I mean, we're married. Of course I can talk to the bank and of course I can talk to their pension, but then they find out they can't mm -hmm. because it that's something that's not jointly titled. It doesn't have both names. When you have accounts like an IRA, 401k, TSP, or a pension, like in one person's name, they're the only person who has authority to to do anything unless there's a financial power of attorney in place, giving another the authority to deal with that. And it's so, so important. So I can't stress that enough. And I think that might be the end of my presentation. I don't like to talk too, too much because I know it's hard to watch this online sometimes, 
Um, and I like people to be able to feel like they can ask me questions. Mm -hmm. So if there are any questions from Debbie, I'm, yes, Debbie. if Debbie can assist me with questions in the chat, I'm happy to, to do that. Yes, Ms. Brandy, I have already sent over the chat. Oh, okay. So someone asked, how does Medicaid look at life insurance? Can the person in the nursing home who has qualified for Medicaid keep enough money to pay their insurance? That is such a great question. So yeah, so the question is life insurance policies. Um, so I feel like it's a, a, a multi-answer question um, answer for this question. But it's a great question because I, I've had a couple of these just in the past month. So um, when I talk about assets and the assets that are looked at, whether it's $2,500 is the cap for the single, $150,000 for the married couple, insurance policies are in that that pool of money, okay? That's that's considered asset. And where that's relevant is not term insurance. Term insurance is usually like it pays out on the death of somebody. Where it's really relevant, and especially with, with the older population, I find this to be the case. There's a lot of life insurance policies that are whole life. They have a cash value. That cash value is considered an asset. So the rule is that if the cash value is 1400 or less, you may keep the policy in place. If it's higher than that, then we're going to have to cash it out. I just did a little bit of a hybrid with a policy that this policy was driving me crazy. There was so much back and forth whether to keep it for the family. I, I wanted to try and keep it for them because I had a death benefit of $5,000. And, and I figured, you know, that'd be nice as a payout, you know, for, for the three daughters that are um, beneficiaries. But, but it was right at the $1,400 mark. So I said, okay, let's cash out $500. And I mean, we're going to count it as, as, as an overall pool of assets, but let's get it under that threshold. And the one thing that the family was at least initially not happy about going to um, the other part of your question is who's going to pay the premium? Because there's an, there is an income rule with Medicaid long-term care. And I mentioned, you know, in terms of how much income you can have, but I didn't talk about anything else. So when you are in long-term care in a facility, you have to pay your income over to the facility. It's considered your patient responsibility. Think of it as like a copay. The only allowable deductions from the income is for supplemental health insurance and a personal needs allowance of $93 a month. That's it. You cannot make a deduction for any bills, including life insurance. Now, with this particular family, um, they just they thought something was a pension, but it turned out to be an IRA. And we, we found this out at the last minute, uh, which um, delayed eligibility by a month because we had to cash it out. But it turned out to be a good thing because I said to them, OK, we can take that $12,000 that we just discovered and we can put it into a pooled special needs trust and that is Medicaid compliant and that trust can play can pay the insurance premium. So and then it's also available because in this situation mom is cognitively very aware and she can have um access to money, you know, because she wants to buy a recliner, if, when she wants new clothing, if she wants a new cell phone, the trust will pay for it. So um, so that was like one result to pay the premium. I actually have another case right now where there is another similar policy. It has like a death benefit of like $7,000, but it has a cash value of around a thousand. We kept the policy, but I explained to um, the adult child, I said, you're gonna have to pay the premium if you wanna keep it going. But luckily the premium is very small. It's like $21 a month, it's not a big deal. But that that's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Also, um... If spouses are in the same nursing home and the they are on Medicaid and one dies, the other will receive life insurance money. Will mm. they then be kicked off Medicaid? Um, it depends on how much. I mean, if they're only going to receive like $1,000 and we can sort of keep it under that $2,500 benchmark, it might work. Um, if it's a significant amount of money, it will need to be spent in the month that it's received, okay? If it carries over to the next month, then it does put the benefits in jeopardy. But if we can spend it down in the month it's received and, and how that spend down works, I don't know. It, it Sometimes 
Um, I mean, if it's like $3,000, it might be worth just paying the nursing home because it's so small. If there's more than like $5,000, maybe I would suggest doing the pooled special needs trust because that would be a way to uh, spend the money down and they would still keep their benefits. Uh, but it kind of depends. It, a lot of this is fact specific and what's going on in the family. Maybe maybe um, there wasn't that much money to begin with, but there was an adult daughter who provided all this like assistance and care and spent her own money and never got reimbursed. I would use that money as an opportunity to reimburse her. So it kind of depends on the facts. Okay. Thank you. And there's one here about the document they mentioned earlier. So will a general durable power of attorney and designation of guardian be sufficient for financial power of attorney document you spoke of earlier? Yeah, so um, the terminology can change, um, but it's the same thing. So when I say financial power of attorney, it's the same thing as a durable power of attorney. The word durable just means that it stays in effect even if the person becomes incapacitated. That's all it means. But uh, but all my powers of attorney have that language that it stays in effect no matter the capacity. And um, so, yes, yeah, so and a, a durable power of attorney is, is a great thing to have. And oftentimes, and there should be a um, paragraph in it that nominates a guardian in case one is needed. But if you have a really good durable or financial power of attorney, we should never need a guardian. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Matorni. There is one more here. Does the child living in the parent home has to be disabled in order to avoid using the home as an as, as asset, I believe? Can you repeat that? Does the child living in the parent parent home has to be disabled in order to avoid using the home as an asset? As an asset? Okay, I, 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 think, I think I know what um, you're saying. And I'm actually really glad you raised it. Okay, so so no, there does not have to be a disabled child um, living in the home in order to protect the home. I think that's what you're asking, like, you know, like how exactly we protect the home. The home is going to be considered like, ex you know, exempt or not available as long as it's indicated that um, the applicant intends to return home. Okay, the, the Medicaid is not going to tell you to sell it as long as that is indicated on the application. However, you bring up a great point about a disabled child because when you have a disabled child, you can transfer the home to the disabled child in their name and that that's a permissible transfer. So a lot of times when I consult uh, with people that come to my office, I ask, is there anyone in the family with a disability? Because that's a way of transferring assets. Mm -hmm. So, in, and it, it's great, it's great to have that option, you know, so that way that, um, that disabled loved one has um, assets now and will help them in their life. And it's just, it's a, it's a really good mechanism to transfer assets so that you can qualify for the, for the benefit. And then you also said they were living in the house more than two years. Or yeah, so um, a question here in the room is uh, when someone's living in the home for two years. So that's, so the rule for that is it, it's, it's the uh, parent child mm -hmm. relationship. Okay. It, it does have to be parent child, but I I have used this particular rule and I have stretched it. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm always transparent about the stretching of it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't hide anything from the caseworker. I say, okay, here's the rule. Here are our facts. And this is why I think you should accept what we're saying mm -hmm. <laughs> and approve this application. There is another rule that's actually really interesting too. When there's a sibling and the sibling has an equity interest in the home, and that, that, that I've used that one very broadly, the equity interest. And they've helped provide care for the past two years in the home. But I once had two brothers. Um, it, it, it's too long to get into all the facts. So I'm going to try and summarize it really quickly. Two brothers, uh, they, they lived down the block from each other. The home that the, um, that the, the, the brother who needed care, the home that he was living in, was really his brother down the road's home, but it was in the name of the, the brother that was not well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I had documentation dating back from the 80s to show the equity interest. This was quite a long chain of documents that I had to establish to prove the equity interest portion. And then um, 
the brother who lived on the block actually did not live in the house because that was the other part of the rule. He had to live in the house to, and provide care, but he lived down the block mm -hmm. and he walked over there every day and helped his brother for years. Mm -hmm. And we got eligibility on that. So, I mean, it kind of fell outside of the four corners of the rule, mm -hmm. but, you know, we were able to, you know, um, transfer the house back to the brother who had the true equity interest who provided care. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's it's very interesting, um, you know, what can be done with some of these rules. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. There's a question here in the room. It's MIPS number seven. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody understood that. Okay. Um, if if a person transfers the money, you know, because they're trying to get the money out of the, the person who's ill. Yeah. Out of their, yeah. If, if they do that and you guys find that it was done, I don't know, maybe, maybe negligently or to to avoid that, that's yeah. when, that's when they, they cannot have yeah, uh, benefits for five years. Or something like that. Oh, okay. Go over the five year thing. Okay. So that there, sure, sure. Thank you. Um, there's a question about the five year look back. And um, I, yeah, so I did not go over that because I was sort of focusing on the myths, but it's a great question. Mm -hmm. So Medicaid does do a five-year look back mm -hmm. from the date of requested eligibility. So if we're asking for February 1, 2024, we're gonna look back to February 1 of 2019. I think I got the math right on that one. And that's the look back period. So they're gonna be looking for any transfers generally over $2,000. They're going to flag and ask a question. Okay, that check for two thousand dollars, who did it go to? Um, that check for fifty thousand dollars, who did it go to? Um, or any other like cash withdrawals? I I have a pending application right now where a mom took out forty five thousand dollars in cash <laughs> in Wisconsin during COVID. And the reason was because she was nervous about her money. Mm -hmm. So I actually completely get it. It was kind of a crazy time. And she also um, had congestive heart failure and she was not doing great and she couldn't get to the bank and she felt so much safer with the money inside of her recliner. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? So, um, yeah, so you know that one is pending, but I feel really good. Like it, I'm sure we're going to get eligibility because if you the bank when you follow the money, it really tells you a story. Um, and mom didn't take out that money for the purpose of qualifying for Medicaid. Like she she knew she was not well, but she didn't do it to qualify for Medicaid. In fact, she really wanted to stay in the home, and so we included that in our narrative because like she she like hospice was threatening to call um, um, adult protective services because she would not leave the home. So like we use these facts to demonstrate she didn't take this money out to qualify for Medicaid. Like she did it for other reasons. So that's sort of the, the operative piece. Um, but it did happen in the five-year look back mm -hmm. and not all that money went back in the account. So when her daughter found out about this, and this is before I was involved, the daughter said, mom, please, can we put some of the money back in the bank? Like, this is really not good. Because the mom was kind of secretive and didn't tell her daughter a lot until she got very sick. And so mom put $10,000 back. But when you look at the bank statements, it really tells a story. She never wrote checks. She had no credit card. She was living off this cash. She was paying neighbors to buy her groceries. So, I mean, this is what we wrote up in the affidavit um, to just address it. So I, I don't get nervous when I see transfers as long as we can kind of go through it. Okay, tell me what happened mm -hmm. and let's see how we're gonna argue it. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's a great question about the five-year look back because it's something that makes people really nervous. Yeah. Are there any other questions or? Yes, um, so related okay. to the second, second question um, earlier, if both spouses are in the nursing home on Medicaid, they can they, still have 150,000 in the bank? So that, that's a complicated one. Um, okay, so the question is, if both spouses are in the nursing home, can they have the $150,000? The answer is gonna be no. And the reason why is because going forward, like they're individual applicants, and it's going to be 2500. Yeah, that that that's a tricky one, but I mean that would have to 
boy, I like if I could get the timing right, I'd I'd want to do something and use the spousal rules to like transfer money, possibly. Well, actually, no, it may not make sense. Now there is a there is a minimum resource standard too. So uh, a married couple can automatically qualify. Um, the applicant can automatically qualify when married if all the spousal assets are under thirty thousand dollars. So that's an automatic qualifying, um, but that's not really answering the question because I think ultimately it's going to have to be that twenty five hundred dollars for each of them, because going forward that's what they look at. They they look at the assets in the individual name. So I, yeah, so it, it's going to have to be the $2,500. Okay. Threshold. So there's another question here. What is the time period for transferring assets before becoming eligible for long-term care? Well, so did everyone hear the question? Okay. I'm not sure if you're asking, can you transfer assets before the five-year look back? I mean, if that's something that somebody wants to do, they can do it. It's before the five-year look back. If you want to transfer for the purpose of qualifying for Medicaid, that's fine. Mm -hmm. The five-year look back is what's relevant, you know, if it happened in that time frame. So sometimes people do transfer large amounts of money because they're worried about Medicaid down the road. I mean, it does happen. Um, I mean, you can transfer money in the five-year look back. I mean, people do it for different reasons. Uh, what if an adult child gets a divorce and needs a $20,000 retainer for their lawyer? I've seen that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, the child cannot give the money back. And so um, we wrote a promissory note mm -hmm. where the child promised to pay. And it's a Medicaid compliant promissory note. It's not just any promissory note. And, and that got approved. So, so there are like workarounds for when there's transfers. I mean, people should just live their lives and spend their money the way they want. That, that's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. And then if you need Medicaid long-term care and you're worried about something that happened, then come talk to me and we'll, and we'll figure out a, a way to like go around it. But I mean, people should just live their life and spend their money. Okay. Um, there's one more here. Why did the word executor change to personal representative and when? So that's really a probate question or a state planning question, but I'll answer it. So the question is, when did the word change from executor to personal representative? I don't really know in Maryland when that happened, but it means the same thing. I mean, I prefer the word executor, so I often just refer to that because I feel like that's commonly known. And when you say personal representative, it's just longer and it's kind of more irritating <laughs> you have to constantly say that over and over again and because people don't often know what you mean because the word executor is so commonly known but it's the same exact role it's the same exact role okay what is the um, current personal needs amount given to ltc patient okay so um when i was talking about income I said that you can make certain deductions from income. One of them is the supplemental health insurance and the other is the personal needs allowance. And currently it is $93 per month in Maryland. So it does change from time to time. Um, in my years of practicing, it's changed several times, but it, it doesn't necessarily change every year. But right now it's at $93 a month. Yeah. Okay, um, regarding with the paperwork again, if some of the information on the durable power of attorney has changed, such as the per, the second secondary POA address, do you need to update the POA paperwork? So the question is when to update power of attorney paperwork. I mean, if someone's address changed, you don't have to update it. That's That's not a big deal. It doesn't affect... The terms of the power of attorney. People move all the time. Even if a, no, a phone number changes, that's not a big deal. Um, but if you have a change in who you want to serve, then I think you should go ahead and change the document. And kind of the rule of thumb is these documents, these planning documents, like a, like a will, a financial power of attorney, a healthcare directive, they should probably be updated every 10 years or when there's a major life event. A major life event is a death, a birth, um, Divorce, remarriage, uh, just or just a total change in family structure, family relationships, if there's falling outs. I mean, that's the time to change the documents. Thank you. And there's last one. For someone who's looking for Medicaid to cover their expenses in LTC or assisted living, what's the typical time frame it's taking to get the approval? So that's a great question. Um 
caseworkers by Maryland rule have to make a decision on eligibility within 45 days of the application being filed. But that doesn't often happen. What often happens is they, they issue a verification request. They ask for something I've already given them. <laughs> they buy themselves some more time. Um, and it usually, we get a determination about 60 to 90 days. <laughs> um, I, I think that they're just generally like, they have a lot on their plate. I am sympathetic. I, I think they are short staffed. They had some kind of security breach over COVID that made things even worse. I mean, applications were taking four to five months to get approval. So, you know, one of the things I do when people hire me is I, I, I kind of, I stay on top of it. Um, I find out who is assigned to the application. I ask them for updates. If they are, if the caseworker is not responsive, I find their supervisor and I send it to them, um, not to get them in trouble, but it's like, Hey, if you're not going to return an email or phone call, I've given you like, they're actually supposed to get back within 48 hours. That's one of their rules. If I don't hear from them for like three, four days, five days, I'm, I'm definitely going to be reaching out to the supervisor. Mm -hmm. So that way I can get a response um, because, you know, I, I want I want the pressure off the family, the stress off the family and the nursing home should get paid. I mean, they are providing care. So, you know, for all those reasons, you know, I'll, I stay on top of the application. Thank you so much, attorney. And I think there's one last question. Um, okay. what, <laughs> what would be your recommendation in a situation where the parents' assets are almost gone, but he does okay. not qualify yet for entrance into Medicaid LTC facility, and he needs cash to pay for his private pay LTC assisted living facility? We are trying to save the home, which is in a trust with his daughters, but if we sell it, all the cash will be in his asset. Yeah, I definitely do not recommend selling the house just based off of what you've told me. So if I, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to sort of see what the question is. So part of the question, so part of the comment was um there's a house and a trust and they don't want to sell it because then the money becomes available, which is correct. The money becomes available to be spent down and that's what people have to realize like the home could be exempt or unavailable, but the moment you sell it and now there's cash, mm -hmm. it's now available and we must spend it down. Mm -hmm. So it's better to keep that equity in the home until we figure out what to do, um, see if there's any other way. But you said it's a married couple. So I'm not sure you know, why the house has to be sold unless um, there's an issue with us keeping it going because uh, one person is in care and the income is going to the facility. Because I, I know that's difficult for a married couple, but there is the spousal allowance. So if the if the spouse who's at home, if they make less than the spouse who is in the care, then generally we can work out an allowance. So that means that we draw some of the money from the income that should go to the nursing home, but it goes to the well spouse. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, without knowing more, I don't really know. Um, but I would I would hesitate on selling the home until you get some more advice. I would just try and keep it as it is. I mean, it, it, at some point it might need to be sold and that might be the reality. But it, if there's a, a spouse living in it, then I, then then definitely not. And I believe um, he's a widow, widower. So I'm sorry? to add up with the question, um, okay. I believe the, yeah, he said, um, she said here that um, he is a widow. Oh, he's a widow. Oh, okay. So I, I that might be something that um, would be worthy of a longer conversation. But I have to tell you that the house being in a trust, um, the 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 person who's oh wait no it's a it's, so it's a widow. Okay, so it's a widow who's trying to qualify for long term care. If the house is in a trust, they're going to tell you to take it out of the trust. Well, okay, so that's true. So someone said depends on what kind of trust. If it's an irrevocable trust that was done more than five years ago, you'll be fine. If it's a revocable trust, they're going to tell you to take it out of the trust. because, And the reason why is because they know they can't attach that probate. And they're not okay with that. Um, that that's part of, you know, they want the ability to make their claim. So um, that that's going to be something that I think needs further discussion. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to say something, Jennifer? I don't want to no, keep you waiting in the wings yeah. here. Oh, no, no worries. <laughs> That's the last question we have. 
That's the last, That's the last question. question. Yeah. yeah. Thank really you so much. much. I mean, the questions were really great. Um, I, I feel like it's it's so good when people ask questions. First, you get to ask an attorney, and there's no charge, right? <laughs> uh, you get to vet me a little bit, but also um, it just gets other people thinking, and and it's a great way for everyone to learn. So thank you so much for attending and asking such great questions. Yes, and so I want to thank Jennifer as well. Um, this was a great great session. I'm sure you guys got a lot of information from it. And if you go back to the question as to why should you or should you hire an attorney, of course, you want to hire the attorney that is the expert in the field because you don't want to make mistakes that might cost you lots of money. So um, thank you again for attending and um, look for our next session. Uh, we will send out information on our next session, but I want to thank you again, Jennifer. Thank you. Wonderful. Jennifer is a, in a Jennifer Tillman <laughs> is a, is a very gracious host. And I, I hope you consider her for your needs as well. She's really a lovely individual and uh, always very nice to work with. So thank you. Well, thank you. So this concludes our um, session today, but you have information on how to reach me as well as how to join our Caring for the Caregivers Facebook group, which again, uh, we provide um, just lots of information and, um, and then information on our upcoming sessions as well. Um, so thank you again, and um, we look forward to seeing you again at another session.